Welcome to the first video for chapter three, The Remarkable Body, where we're gonna step away from most aspects of food for now and talk about some pertinent anatomy and physiology. The learning objectives for this video are to review basics of the human cells, tissues, organs, and body systems, discuss the circulation of uh, blood and body fluids and their interaction with cells, Highlight nutrition-related aspects of the nervous system, hormonal system, gut flora, and defecation. And then outline fundamentals of digestion and absorption of food. So we can start with the human cell. The cell is the basic structural unit of all living organisms. And the human body is composed of trillions of them. Cells are individual and self-contained, but they are also interdependent. What this means is that they are individual entities, but they also depend on one another to survive. Cells do die at varying rates, and this just emphasizes the importance of maintaining adequate nutrition. For example, we can think about intestinal cells, which die off every few days, compared to red blood cells, which are uh, broken down and regenerated about every three months. So welcome to the first video for chapter three, The Remarkable Body, where we're going to step away from food for the most part and focus on some pertinent anatomy and physiology for this course. The learning objectives for this video are to review basics of the human cells, tissues, organs, and body systems, discuss the circulation of blood and body fluids and their interaction with cells, highlight nutrition-related aspects of the nervous system, hormonal system, gut flora, and defecation, and outline fundamentals of the digestion and absorption of food. We can start by looking at the human cell and the cell is the basic structural unit of all living organisms. The human body is composed of trillions of cells. Cells are individual and self-contained, but they are also interdependent, meaning they depend on one another in order to survive. Cells die at varying rates, and this just emphasizes the importance of maintaining adequate nutrition. Take, for example, intestinal cells, which die off every couple days, and so they need a constant supply of nutrition in order to regenerate properly. Here are two pictures taken from the textbook. On the left, we can see the individual cell. Now we don't spend too much time looking inside the cell and the individual components. I think it is enough to know that in the middle we have the nucleus with the DNA inside. The DNA is going to contain all the information that is going to make us who we are, what we look like, and how we function. So moving to the right, we can say we have the DNA and chromosomes, and these are found in the genes. And that is basically just going to have the code, and it's going to lead to the production of proteins. And those proteins are going to determine the function and the form of the cell. So the genes are going to lead to the production of proteins. The proteins are going to make up the living cell. And then the cell is going to join together with other cells to create tissues. Now, cells are organized into tissues that perform specialized tasks. So we have a muscle cell on its own isn't going to do a whole lot, but it joins to form muscle tissue, and then that muscle tissue can contract as a function. Tissues are grouped together to form organs. So this is a group of tissues that perform specific jobs. Some familiar ones will be the heart, liver, and brain. Those are organs. And then organs work together as part of a body system. 
So a body system is a group of organs that work together to perform a function. The example I have listed here is the heart, lungs, and blood vessels cooperate as part of the cardiorespiratory system. So this is the means by which we obtain oxygen and deliver oxygen and nutrients to all the cells in the body. It's also the way in which we get rid of waste. We have some pictures of individual organs on the left-hand side, and then we have some systems on the right-hand side. So you may recognize the brain, the lungs, heart, liver, stomach, intestines, kidneys, uterus, and I think this one right here, this looks like it is an adrenal gland. Then in the middle, we'll have the musculoskeletal system. This is composed of the skeletal muscle and the skeleton or bones. And on the far right, we have the circulatory system. This has all of our blood cells, I mean, blood vessels in the heart. And that is where we're gonna start, body fluids in the circulatory system. Our body fluids supply energy, oxygen, nutrients, and water to tissues and pick up waste for removal. The two body fluids that we focus on here are blood and lymph. Now blood travels within arteries, veins, capillaries, and the heart's chambers. And lymph travels in its own vessels, but eventually empties into the bloodstream. Now we can look at the flow of blood in the body. We could start anywhere really, but we'll start here with deoxygenated blood, blood with no oxygen, entering the heart. It's going to be pushed out and travel to the lungs where it's gonna pick up oxygen. Now it is oxygenated blood and it's returning to the heart and the heart is gonna pump it out through the aorta and it's gonna go out to the rest of the body. One area of emphasis right here in when it comes to nutrition, this is blood flowing to the stomach and intestines and the small intestine is where the majority of absorption of nutrients occurs. And so nutrients are absorbed here and they go directly to the liver and the liver is an organ that's like a processing machine and it's going to transform, package, store, activate things to be traveled in the blood and go out to the rest of the cells in the body. On the right hand side, we can see how blood and uh, blood cells, nutrients are going to be interacting with the cells in our tissues. Now you may think of your veins as just these tubes that are passing by your tissues, but they're really interwoven within those tissues. So the function of this is so that they can really interact with all the different cells. If it was just one tube going through, right? Not all the cells would get a chance to interact, but since they're woven through, they have all the channels so they have access to all the different cells. Within the blood vessels, you can see these cells lining them. And then there's little cracks that our body fluids are gonna be able to leak out of. So they leak out into the space here, and then they have a chance to interact with the cells. And so they will deliver nutrients to the cells, they'll pick up waste, and then that waste is gonna either continue back into the bloodstream, or it can drain off into the limb, and eventually it's gonna be uh, on its way out the body. The organs of the circulatory system, we've already mentioned some of them, but here we go again, the aorta, that's where the blood is, you know, initially pumped out from the heart on its way to the tissues. We have the lungs, which oxygenate, oxygenate blood, remove carbon dioxide from the blood, the heart, pumps blood to the lungs, and then pumps oxygenated blood to the body. The liver filters toxins from blood. It also is that 
organ that stores, transforms, and mobilize nutrients and gets them ready to be used by the body. The intestine, especially the small intestine, absorbs the nutrients. And then the kidneys, which we have not mentioned yet, they filter waste from the blood and form urine and deliver it to the bladder for excretion or removal from the body. Now I've already detailed this verbally, but here you have it written out, the uh, process of blood circulation. Blood circulates to the lungs, picks up oxygen, releases carbon dioxide. Blood returns to the heart, it's pumped to the rest of the body via the aorta. Blood passes through the digestive system, delivers nutrients, which are routed directly to the liver via the hepatic portal vein. And then the blood is cleansed of waste in the kidneys. The lymph is going to be a uh, set of vessels that are gonna run separate from the bloodstream. Now, the primary function of the lymph when it comes to nutrition is that it's going to pick up most of the dietary fat from the digestive tract. In doing so, it's also going to be responsible for picking up fat-soluble vitamins. These are vitamins D, E, K, and A. Now, we know that fat and water don't mix, and this is going to be the reason that our body needs a separate transport system for the fat. And we'll get into the details of that when we do our lipids chapter. But for now, it's enough to know that where the water-soluble nutrients are going to be picked up in the bloodstream like this, the fat-soluble are going to be picked up in the lymph, and eventually they're going to enter the bloodstream. So unlike the water-soluble nutrients that are directed straight to the liver, the fat-soluble nutrients, the fat and the fat-soluble vitamins, are picked up by the lymph. They don't go directly to the liver. They are dropped off higher up into the bloodstream. Eventually, they'll make their, live, their way to the liver after circulating through the body. That is it for the circulatory system. We're now gonna briefly touch upon the hormonal system and the nervous system. Hormones are chemical messengers released into the blood by glands. So the glands are basically the sensors that are monitoring conditions in the body and then stimulating organs to act. The two examples of hormones that I want you to know are insulin and glucagon. Now, these play a major role in managing blood glucose levels. The organ that is primarily associated with insulin and glucagon is the pancreas. Now, some of you may know that we have blood sugar, aka blood glucose, and our body has a certain range that we want to be at. So we call this homeostasis. When we eat food, it's going to increase the blood glucose level and our body or our pancreas will sense this and in doing so it's going to release insulin. What insulin does is going to signal to the cells to take up more glucose so that it's going to decrease the amount of sugar in the blood. It's also going to signal to the liver to take up glucose and store it. So when it does these two things the blood glucose level comes back to where our body wants it to be, in homeostasis. Now let's pretend after this occurs, we don't eat for four hours or so. So when this happens, the blood glucose level is going to drop down where we want it to be. Our pancreas is going to sense that. It's going to release glucagon. The glucagon is going to signal to the liver to break down that stored glucose and it's gonna release it into the bloodstream to bring the blood sugar back up. So this is just a example of hormonal action that is very relevant to nutrition. And we will return to this when we discuss carbohydrates and then much later in this uh, course when we talk about diabetes.
Now, insulin and glucagon are just two small examples. There's many other hormones, and here are some other functions. Hormones regulate the digestive system in response to meals or fasting. They help regulate hunger and appetite. They influence appetite changes during a woman's menstrual cycle and in pregnancy, and they regulate the body's reaction to stress, suppressing hunger and digestion. Now we'll do the nervous system. The nervous system receives information from sensory receptors all over the body, and it runs primarily through electrical signaling. So we have our five senses, sight, smell, hearing, touch, and taste. And our body communicates the information that we receive to the brain, which is going to then coordinate a response. The example I have for you guys is hunger, which is an example of the nervous system's role in nutrition. The digestive tract uses electrical signals as well as hormones. Um, they send them to our brain to induce hunger. This response can be stimulated by inadequate intake or just the sight, smell, and taste of food. So we don't eat for a while. Our digestive tract is gonna be able to sense this it's going to send electrical signals to our brain to tell us that we need nutrition, we need food, and that's going to drive our hunger. Now, as we all know, even if we aren't supposed to be hungry, if we see, smell, or get a small taste of something really tasty, that can stimulate our hunger too. So there we have it just the hormonal system and nervous system very briefly. The last system we talk about is the digestive system. And this one is pertinent for you guys to know for this course. And it is the system that digests food, absorbs nutrients and excretes waste products. Another word for digest is breaks down. Absorb should be pretty self-explanatory, but it is bringing it from the digestive tract into the body. And then excrete, another word for that would be to get rid of. The digestive system is directed by the nervous system and hormones. It is characterized by the gastrointestinal tract, the GI tract or digestive tract. And this extends from our mouth to our anus. The total length is about 26 feet long, which is pretty incredible. Here are the organs of the digestive system. We can see on the left-hand side, we have the mouth, including the tongue, the teeth, and saliva glands. So we eat food, right? We put it in our mouth. We start breaking it down uh, with our teeth. We manipulate it with our tongue and our saliva glands start softening it and lubricating it for it to go down our throat. Our throat is called the esophagus and that esophagus is emptying down into our stomach. Here the food is going to be all mixed and mashed and broken down further until it's ready to be released into the small intestine. In the small intestine, this is where the majority of nutrient absorption is gonna take place. It's gonna absorb nutrients as it travels along, eventually flowing into the large intestine, at which point it is preparing the body to get the food out of it or whatever the waste products are in the form of feces. So it's gonna travel its way through the large intestine and eventually we're passing the waste products out of the body in the form of feces or poop. Those are the major organs or the primary organs. Then we also have various accessory organs and these just play a role in assisting the breakdown and absorption of food. Now, ones that you should know about, the pancreas is going to break, uh, provide various enzymes, which are chemicals that are going to help to break down the food. And then also the liver, which is going to create something called bile that assists in the digestion of fat. 
and that bile is stored in an organ called the gallbladder. So when the body senses food in the small intestine, it's going to excrete or send out bile into the small intestine. The pancreas is going to do the same thing with its enzyme, and it's going to contribute to the breakdown of food. Here we have our primary organs of the GI tract. Our mouth chews and mixes food with saliva. The esophagus is just a tube that's passing food to the stomach. The stomach adds acid enzymes, those chemicals that are breaking things, helping to break things down, and fluid. The stomach is going to churn, mix, and grind food to a liquid mass. Small intestine is going to filter toxins from blood. Oh, that's not right. I'm sorry, guys. This is supposed to be liver, not small intestine. You know what, guys? I am very sorry. This chart is incorrect, so I'm going to have to send you an updated one. Um, and I will do that through NYU classes. So these last two ones are correct. The rectum is gonna store waste prior to elimination and the anus holds the rectum closed and it opens to allow that feces or poop to pass through. These two, as I've already mentioned, are incorrect. This one should be the liver and this one should be the small intestine. Then we also have accessory organs of the GI tract. These are the ones that uh, are gonna assist in the breakdown of food. So we have the salivary glands, which we talked about. And one aspect we haven't mentioned is that the sal saliva is gonna have some enzymes that are gonna break down some of the carbohydrate that we eat. We have the pancreas, which is gonna produce those enzymes that break down the macronutrients. Uh, and they also, also help to uh, neutralize stomach acid. The liver manufactures bile, and that is what helps in the digestion of fat. And then the gallbladder stores the bile until it's needed. Now, this is the mechanical aspect of food. I already kind of did this with the picture of the mouth and the, uh, the organs, but we're gonna go through it one more time because it's very important for you to understand. So the mechanical aspect of digestion is, begins in the mouth where we're breaking the food into smaller pieces, sharpening edges and releasing nutrients. Then the stomach and the small intestine, we're liquefying food through various mashing and squeezing action. And then the large intestine, is removing the water and preparing waste for excretion. Some terms to know for mechanical di uh, digestion. Peristalsis, this is wave-like muscular squeezing of the esophagus, stomach, and small intestine that pushes the contents along. So we can see our um, digestive tract here. It's uh, different layers of muscle and we can see the inner layer is uh, circular, and then the outer fibers run uh, longitudinally. And what this does is they contract and it helps to propel the food down the tube. So peristalsis helps to move the food along the digestive tract. Another term to know is chyme, and this is what our food becomes. Uh, once it passes through the stomach. So it enters the stomach as food, and then after the max, uh, mashing and mixing and the breakdown of it, when by the time it's leaving the stomach, we call it chyme. This brings us to the chemical aspect of digestion. So the saliva functions in the mouth, enzymes begin to break down carbohydrates, Saliva also helps to maintain the health of the teeth. The chemical aspect of the stomach, the gastric juice initiates protein digestion. And the things that the stomach is releasing is water, enzymes, and hydrochloric acid. In the small intestine, we have that gallbladder releasing bile. 
which emulsifies the fat. We'll see what that means in just a moment. And then the pancreas is releasing enzymes that break down the carbohydrates, protein, and fat, our macronutrients. So terms to know for chemical digestion, we have that emulsification. So this is the process by which two unmixable liquids are mixed and it's required for the digestion of fat to occur. So we know that fat and water don't mix. And so when they enter the small intestines, they're gonna separate. Now emulsification is gonna be the process that we get those two liquids to mix, to mix together. And this is necessary so that the enzymes that break down fat can interact with the fat. So we have a fat globule. We have the bile, which serves as the emulsifier. Then the bile acts on that large fat globule and it's going to create small fat droplets. So once this bile or the emulsifier gets hold of these droplets and are covering it, now this can interact with the water component of the chyme in the small intestine. And you have these uh, enzymes which are floating around in the water. Now they have a chance to interact on them because before they were floating around, but since they were separated, they weren't be able to get after that flat fat droplet. If you don't understand this currently, we will see this again prior to exam one. Uh, we'll talk about it during our lipids lecture. On to the absorption and transport of nutrients. The majority of absorption takes place in the small intestine. So here, carbohydrates, protein, and most vitamins, minerals are absorbed into the bloodstream. Our fat and our vitamins D, E, K, and A are absorbed into the lymphatic system. The structure of the uh, small intestines make it ideal for absorption. We have what are called villi and microvilli, and they basically make this brush-like uh, texture to the small intestine. So we can see when you look at it from uh, a uh, zoomed out view, it looks like this brush, you could call it a brush border. And then when we look in, it's like these little individual finger-like projections. And what this does is it really creates more surface area for our small intestine to interact with the chyme that is flowing past or through it. So if we think about this, if this was just flat with cells, then there would be limited space for the chyme to interact. But with these finger-like projections, it creates a lot more space, uh, a lot of surface area for that interaction to occur. And so the body becomes very efficient and very good at absorbing the nutrients we eat in food. So since I feel like we've already done it twice, I'm not gonna go through it again. But this image was here just to serve as an opportunity to go through it one more time, right? Breaking the food down in the mouth, sending it through the esophagus to the stomach, then going into the small intestines, getting the interaction from these chemical aspects of digestion, uh, the absorption happening, and then passing through the small intestine to the large intestine, and then out the body in the form of feces. There are actually some quite good YouTube videos that are just a few minutes long. So if you find that you're struggling with this uh, aspect of the lecture, then just type into YouTube, you know, digestive system or something. And I'm sure you can find a short video that you can really uh, hammer at home. Now two uh, miscellaneous topics that we will highlight here. Uh, just because I feel like they're kind of uh, popular. One being the bacteria in the large intestine. This is commonly referred to as the gut flora or the gut microbiota. And these are 
right, living bacteria in our large intestine, and they feed on some fiber fragments. So fiber is a component of our food that our body does not have the ability to break down. So it's not absorbed in the small intestine. It passes into the large intestine where this bacteria lives, and it feeds on some of those fiber fragments. Now, this sounds a little worrisome, right? We have this bacteria, or tons of it, and it's feasting on the food that we eat. But it's actually a very good thing, and it's very essential to our health. So one thing that the uh, gut bacteria do is they produce these things called short-chain fatty acids, and they also produce vitamin K and B vitamins. Now, for the purpose of this course, I really just wanted to mention it, uh, but this is a rapidly evolving area of research and nutrition, health, and medicine. It's also a very complicated topic. So I just wanted to mention it, uh, but I don't intend to go any further than what I just mentioned now. The other miscellaneous topic is defecation. So this is the final act of digestion. Sometimes you'll see it referred to as elimination. And it is the elimination of solid, semi-solid, or liquid mace, uh, waste material. If we're just being straight up, this is pooping. So the frequency of defecation varies from a few times daily to a few times weekly. And we have what's called diarrhea. That's when you have loose stool three or more times a day. And we also have constipation which is less than three bowel movements per week or, and uh, difficulty passing stool. Now these can be acute issues that someone has, right? Oh, I, ha I was constipated today, but I'm fine now. Um, or it can also be a chronic issue for people. And there are various nutritional remedies and uh, you know, medical approaches to managing diarrhea and constipation which are beyond the scope of this course, um, but I'm happy to discuss them with you in our weekly meeting or if you'd like to in private. One thing you guys will see, especially those of you that are going into nursing, is the Bristol stool chart. And this is something a practitioner can show a patient to help get an idea of what the patient is experiencing in terms of their stool or feces output. Uh, so we have seven types of stool. The first two, two are indicators that somebody is constipated. Types three and four are ideal stool or great poop. And then five, six, and seven are diarrhea or urgency. Um, so this is something that, like I said, if you're going into medical field or health professional, you're gonna see at one point or another. And we want to aim to be in the three to four. If we're constantly having other uh, outside the three and four, then we might want to look closer at what we're eating or other things that are going into our or into our body or happening with our lifestyle. So that is it for video number one for chapter three. I will return soon for video number two, where we're going to talk about alcohol and the risks and possible benefits associated with it.